Today we continue a series called On the Road with Jesus. And the text for today's sermon comes from a section of Luke's Gospel where Jesus' disciples are literally on the road with Him. And that seems perfect because for some time now I have been thinking of the church of Jesus Christ as a big, happy crowd of people following along behind Him down some dusty country road. I don't know why it's a country road. It could just as easily be a street in the inner city, but in my imagination, it's a country road, and I'm going to stick with that. There they are, following along behind Jesus, some of them as close as they can get, so they will hear every word He speaks. Some are tagging along in the back of the crowd. They're just happy to be part of the, the fun. There are some who are helping people up who have stumbled, others who are calling people back who have wandered off the road and into the wilderness. Some aren't really part of this group. They don't really belong, at least not yet, but they have come close enough to overhear what Jesus has to say, to wonder among themselves whether or not they want to follow. But there they are in my imagination, big, happy crowd of people following Jesus down some lovely, dusty country road. This is the church, and the only time it gets in trouble is when it stops to build a building because then it has to decide who is in and who is out. And of course, who has to pay the utility bills? That's a problem. But for the duration of this series, let's imagine that we are the church, and we are on the road with Jesus, journeying toward Jerusalem, watching everything He does, listening to everything He says, learning everything we can from Him in this lengthy section of Luke's Gospel that is known as the travel narrative. It begins in chapter 9, verse 51, and goes all the way through to chapter 19, verse 27. And along the way, Jesus is teaching His disciples, performing miracles, helping them understand what it means to be part of God's kingdom. Last week, we looked at the end of chapter 9, where three would-be followers of Jesus were warned that the journey wasn't going to be an easy one. And we were reminded that it never is. In his commentary on that passage, Alan Culpepper writes, therefore, one should not rush into discipleship with glib promises. On the contrary, the radical demands of discipleship require that every potential disciple consider the cost, give Jesus the highest priority in one's life, and, having committed oneself to discipleship, move ahead without looking back." Which makes me want to ask, are you still with me? on this journey? Can you keep on following Jesus even when the demands of discipleship are great? I hope so. If you can, turn with me to Luke chapter 10, and let's focus especially on verse 1. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, where Luke says, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of Him in pairs to every town and place where He Himself intended to go. And maybe we should stop right there. Because some of you are reading from the Pew Bibles, a different version, and if you noticed, it says Jesus sent out 72 disciples, not 70, and you must be wondering. Did the preacher make a mistake? Can he not see right here? It says clearly 72. Well, it does. And that's a problem I had to deal with last Monday morning when I was studying for this sermon. I have a commentary that has the New International Version on one side and the New Revised Standard Version on the other, side by side. I looked at the NIV, and it said that Jesus sent out 72 disciples. I looked at the NRSV. It said that He sent out 70 disciples. And I wrote it down in my notes, just like this, NIV 72, NRSV 70. It looked 
like a basketball score where the NIV had beaten the NRSV by two points at the buzzer. But listen to this explanation because it's one of the reasons I love to study the Bible, to get down deep into the text. It turns out that in Genesis 10, there is a list of all the nations of the earth at that time. And when it was originally written in Hebrew, and you counted up all the nations, there were 70. But when those words were translated into Greek centuries later, the number that came out was 72. And for some people who didn't read Hebrew, who only read Greek, the number that they saw was 72, not 70. And so as Luke's gospel was published and copies were made, about half the people making copies wrote down 70 and the other half wrote down 72. The ancient manuscripts are equally divided. I can't give you the definitive answer on how many disciples were sent out, but I do believe this, that in both cases, Luke was trying to tell us that Jesus sent out just as many disciples as were needed to carry the message of the kingdom to the whole world, to every nation. In the chapter just before this, when Luke tells us that Jesus sent out 12 disciples, and you know that in the Bible the number 12 is important, right? 12 sons of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel, you get the idea that Jesus is sending out as many disciples as will be needed to carry the good news to the whole nation of Israel. But here in chapter 10, he sends out 70 disciples, or maybe 72, as many as will be needed to carry the good news to the whole world, to every nation on the earth. Listen as I read from Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. And listen how even though the numbers are different, the mission remains the same. Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you, as you are leaving the town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. Now listen to the similarities in today's reading from Luke chapter 10, where he sends out the 70 on a very similar mission. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in your peace your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and the people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Did you get all of that? Were you taking good notes? I hope so, because I believe these instructions were not only intended for those 70 but also for each of us. Alan Culpepper writes, the sending out of the 70 reminds us that Jesus sent out not just the 12, but perhaps all his followers. If we take that comment seriously and consider ourselves sent ones, that is, apostles, what would we need to know before we begin 
our mission. First of all, we would need to know that this is a big job, and it's going to take more than 12 of us. It's going to take more than 70 or even 72 of us. Those are wonderful symbolic numbers, but if we are going to reach the whole world with the good news, it is going to take all of us. And that means that every believer will have to become a missionary. Let me say that again just so you'll get it. Every believer will have to become a missionary. I believe that when Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, he means other laborers. He is taking it for granted that we are already on board, already hard at work. We're like field hands who are out there working in the field, watching a storm roll in from the west, begging somebody to send for more help so that we can get the crop in before the storm comes. There is a sense of urgency about this mission. Secondly, just as following Jesus is not easy, being on mission for Him is not easy. I am sending you out as lambs into the midst of wolves, He says, and you wonder why He would do that at all. Why would Jesus send His little flock into the midst of a murderous pack? Well, only because he has no choice. It has to be done. He cannot wait until conditions are safer or easier. There is an urgency to this mission that is communicated in his next sentence. Greet no one on the road, he says, which means don't even say hello to anybody. Don't wave to your fellow travelers. Keep your head down, your mission in view. Don't get distracted. Thirdly, there seems to be this understanding that we shouldn't wait until we raise enough money for our mission trip. We should just go. Don't carry a purse, Jesus says, which could also be translated as wallet or money belt or any other emergency means of provision. Carry no bag or sandals, he says, which might mean that you shouldn't even take time to pack a suitcase. You've got to get on the road. And don't worry about making hotel reservations in advance. Jesus says, when you arrive on the mission field, simply walk up to the first house you find and say, peace be on this house. And if a person of peace is there, they will open the door and take you in and give you what you need. So don't be going from door to door looking for a softer bed or a better meal. Stay put. Be grateful. Eat what is set before you. Fourthly, do the work of a missionary. It's interesting that Jesus tells both the 12 and the 70 to do the same thing. In Luke 9, he sends the 12 out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. In Luke 10, he sends the 70 out to cure the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. At this stage of his ministry, at least, Jesus' disciples are instructed to do the same things they have seen Jesus doing, healing people, telling them about the kingdom. Later on, after his death and resurrection, Jesus will give them further instructions, but for now, this is enough to heal people and do it as a sign that God's kingdom is on its way into the world. Fifthly and finally, don't get discouraged. I love it that Jesus says if you go into a town and they welcome you, then cure the sick and tell them the kingdom of God has come near. But if they don't welcome you, then wipe the dust off your feet and tell them that the kingdom of God has come near. It's true either way, whether they receive it or not. And so just before he sends them out, Jesus says, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. And that's a comfort, isn't it? Because it's not about you. It's about God and God's purposes. You are simply the messenger. 
In last week's passage, I skipped right over the part where a Samaritan village doesn't receive Jesus. And his disciples, James and John, come to him and say, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus says, no, you idiots, no. Don't do that. You see, Jesus knows that this is not about him. If the Samaritans won't receive his message, he will go on to others who will, and the Samaritans will never know how close the kingdom came. So let me summarize. It's not just the 12 who are sent out on a mission, and it's not just the 70. If we're going to get this message to the world, it's going to take all of us, that whole big happy crowd of people following along after Jesus. And this is what we're going to have to do. One, realize what a big job this is and pray for extra help. Two, understand that it won't be easy, but it is urgent. Three, don't wait until we can gather together enough resources, just go. Four, do the work of a missionary. Heal the sick and tell people the kingdom has come near. And five, don't get discouraged. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting God. Got it? Good. Now go. I'm sure that's what Jesus said to the 70, and I'm almost equally sure that there was one of them in the back who raised his hand and said, excuse me, teacher, um, I can tell people that the kingdom has come near, but I can't heal people. What am I supposed to do? It's a good question. Because in Luke 9, Jesus gave the twelve power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. But in Luke 10, Jesus doesn't give the seventy anything except these marching orders. It's kind of where we are, isn't it? I prayed for someone at the hospital yesterday, and I said, I don't have any healing power in my hands. I can't heal the sick. But I know someone who can, and I know how to ask, and he knows how to answer. And so, Lord Jesus, do for this man what I can't. Help him and heal him and get him up out of this hospital bed. And when I finished that prayer, his wife looked at me as if the kingdom of God had come near. Not because I have any healing power in my hands, but because I know someone who does and because I was bold enough to ask. Today we are sending out several mission teams with just those kinds of credentials. They don't have any power of their own, but they know who has it, and they are bold enough to ask. And they know that it's not just physical healing people need, but healing of every kind, the kind that will make their lives and not just their bodies whole. So they're going off to places like Ghana and Arkansas and South Africa and Singapore and the Philippines and Kentucky to do what they can for people and to ask Jesus to do what they can't and to claim it all as a sign of the coming kingdom of God. It's getting closer every day. But those missionaries going to those places, they aren't the only ones. Look around you. Look all around you in this room. There are all the rest of us, and we have a mission too. In fact, this year-long every member mission trip to bring the kingdom of heaven to Richmond, Virginia, is perfectly in line with what Jesus asks the 70 to do. To realize what a big job it is and to pray for additional help, to understand that it won't be easy, but it is urgent. To go and not wait until we gather up adequate resources. 
to heal the sick and tell people that the kingdom of God has come near, and finally, to not get discouraged. And that may be the hardest part of all. Because we've been on this mission trip now for 301 days, and so far the kingdom of heaven has not come to Richmond, Virginia. Not entirely, at least. Could make you want to give up. If you've been hard at work out there day after day, if you don't see the signs of progress, it could make you want to give up. And if you never joined in, you might say, you see, I told you so. What's the point? But look at what happened in today's reading. Right there at the end. The 70, Luke says, returned with joy. Because there is joy in this work. I have seen it myself. Some of you had a hard time getting off the bus and onto the mission field. But when you did, when you finally just made up your mind to do something instead of nothing, you found joy in it. I've heard the stories over and over again in the last 10 months. I have seen people's faces radiant with joy. In today's passage, Jesus saw that kind of joy on the faces of his disciples as they said to him, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. Jesus rejoiced right along with them. In fact, he may have gotten a little carried away. He said, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. And see, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Well, maybe. I wouldn't go around testing that theory, especially if you were on the mission trip to Kentucky, because I've, I've been there, and the snakes are big. <laughs> Don't step on them. But listen to what Jesus says next. Nevertheless, do not rejoice over this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Because in the end, this is all that will matter. It won't matter how many demons we cast out or how many snakes we stepped on or how successful we were in our mission. It will only matter how faithful we were. Did we actually do what Jesus told us to go and do? Because if we did, I believe we will one day hear him say, well done, good and faithful missionary, enter into the joy of the Lord. And that really is the greatest joy of all. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for calling us into your mission, for asking us to go into the world to heal the sick and tell them that the kingdom has come near. And we confess that we aren't so good at healing. There is no power in our hands to make people well. And yet there is power there. And in the last 10 months, we've been discovering it. We have been able to feed people who are hungry and shelter people who are homeless and help people who are discouraged and read to children who need somebody to read to them. There have been so many ways in which the members of this congregation have reached out to the city around them and to the surrounding counties with the love of God in a way that has made a difference people have been helped and healed. Their lives have become more whole. And in all of this, the kingdom has come closer. Keep us on your mission, Lord Jesus. Help us see the progress we are making. Encourage us day by day as we go out to do what you told us to do. We do it in your name. And for the sake of your kingdom, amen.